For centuries, they were portrayed as the nightmare of civilization, the quintessential barbarians, the Scythians. Herodotus, the Greek father of history, described them with both fascination and horror. Wild nomads, who drank the blood of their enemies from human skulls, who lived on horseback, who scorned the settled life of towns and fields. These were the savages who threatened the civilized world, or so we've been told. But history, as you may have suspected, isn't always honest. These masterpieces, created by those same barbarians, tell a different story. The delicate artistry of these golden treasures rivals anything produced in Athens or Rome. Look at the intricate detail, the mastery of form. This isn't the work of simple savages. So who were they really? A people capable of both fierce warfare and sublime artistic expression. A contradiction that challenges everything we thought we knew about civilization and barbarism. The answer has been hidden for millennia. Not in ancient scrolls or biased histories written by their enemies, but in the most truthful record of all, their DNA. Recent breakthroughs in genetic science have unlocked secrets that rewrite history, and what they reveal about these misunderstood people might just change how you see the world today. Because the truth about Europe's so-called barbarian kings has been forbidden not by some ancient decree, but by our own modern prejudices about identity, civilization, and power. What if I told you that the strength of these remarkable people came not from purity, but from diversity, and that their genetic story challenges the very foundations of how we think about European history? Stay with me as we uncover the extraordinary truth about who the Scythians really were, and why powerful interests throughout history preferred to keep their actual story buried. You might be wondering who exactly were the Scythians. The first revelation might surprise you. Scythian wasn't even a name they used for themselves. It was a convenient label created by outsiders Greeks and Persians to simplify a complex reality they barely understood. Rather like calling all Native American tribes Indians. When scientists first began analyzing Scythian DNA, they expected to find a single origin point, one people with one genetic signature. What they discovered instead shattered conventional wisdom. The true Scythian genetic fingerprint revealed something remarkable, a consistent mixture of about 10% East Asian or Siberian ancestry blended with a Western steppy base. This distinct genetic signature is what truly defines a classic Scythian, not their language, not their artifacts, but this specific genetic blend. You see, while our history books present neat, tidy categories of peoples and nations, the genetic evidence tells us that human history is far messier and far more interesting. This genetic mixing didn't happen by accident. Scientists have pinpointed the crucible of Scythian identity to here, the majestic Altai Mountains, where Central Asia meets Siberia. Around 900 BCE, something momentous occurred. Western steppe herders, related to the earlier Yamnaya culture, encountered and mixed with local Siberian populations. This wasn't just another migration. This was the genesis moment of a new people. What happened next was extraordinary. These new hybrid people didn't just stay in the Altai. They expanded westward in what scientists call a reflux, like a powerful wave washing back across the steppe, bringing their unique DNA and revolutionary culture with them. Within a few generations, they dominated the entire Eurasian steppe from Mongolia to the gates of Europe. Their military prowess was unmatched, but not for the reasons you might think. Their success wasn't due to savagery or barbarism. It came from something far more powerful, a genetic and cultural advantage their enemies couldn't understand and weren't prepared to face. And that advantage? It had something to do with who they allowed to ride and fight alongside their men. Something so shocking to the ancient Greeks that they created an entire mythology to explain it. Because the next chapter in the Scythian story reveals the truth behind one of history's most enduring myths, and proves that sometimes, legends have the deepest roots in reality. You've heard of the Amazons, haven't you? Those legendary warrior women from Greek mythology who supposedly cut off one breast to better draw their bows? For centuries, scholars dismissed them as pure fantasy, just another tall tale from the ancient world. Then, archaeologists made a discovery that left them speechless. Across the Scythian territories, 
they uncovered burial after burial of women, interred with full sets of weapons. Bows, arrows, battle axes, daggers, up to one-third of all weapon-bearing graves in some Scythian cemeteries belonged to women. Perhaps these were symbolic, some scholars suggested. Ritual objects, not actual weapons of war. But the bones told another story. These women bore the same battle scars as their male counterparts, healed fractures from combat, arrowheads embedded in their remains. These weren't ceremonial figures. They were warriors who lived and died by the bow and sword. For those of you who remember the Cold War, this discovery was made by Soviet archaeologists decades ago, but dismissed in the West as communist propaganda aimed at promoting gender equality. The truth was literally buried by modern political biases. It took 21st century DNA analysis to settle the question once and for all. Genetic testing confirmed what the Soviets had claimed. These were indeed biological females, buried with the honors and weapons of warriors. The Amazon myth wasn't fantasy after all. It was the Greek interpretation of a society where women held significant power and martial roles. A society so different from their own that they could only understand it as something mythical. But the genetic evidence revealed something even more fascinating. The maternal DNA of these warrior women showed remarkable diversity. Many came from distant cultures, Greek, Persian, Central Asian, even Chinese ancestry. They weren't just warriors. They were genetic diplomats, bringing new bloodlines into the Scythian gene pool. In a world where most civilizations prized female purity and seclusion, the Scythians were incorporating powerful women from across the known world into their ranks, some through marriage alliances, others perhaps as captives who earned their place, and still others as refugees fleeing the constraints of their birth cultures. Think about what this meant. While Athens was debating whether women should be allowed to leave their homes unaccompanied, Scythian women were commanding armies and serving as battle companions to their kings. This wasn't just cultural, it was strategic. In the harsh world of the steppe, a society that utilized the talents of all its members, regardless of gender, had a profound advantage over those that didn't. And here's where it gets truly revolutionary. This discovery forces us to reconsider everything we thought we knew about power in the ancient world. Because the Scythians weren't just challenging gender roles, they were challenging the very concept of what made a successful empire. Their true innovation, the one that their contemporaries found most threatening, was something far more profound than their military tactics or their horsemanship. It was their radical approach to identity itself, an approach that directly contradicted everything the civilized world believed about power and purity. But to truly understand how different the Scythians were, we need to look at what they left behind, preserved in a most extraordinary way. While Egypt has its pyramids, the Scythians created their own portals to immortality, the Kurgans. These burial mounds dot the landscape from Ukraine to Mongolia, silent sentinels guarding secrets for millennia. But nature provided something the pharaohs never had, perfect natural refrigeration. In the high Altai Mountains, something extraordinary happened. Groundwater seeped into royal burial chambers and froze solid, creating perfect time capsules sealed in ice for over 2,400 years. When Soviet archaeologists opened these frozen tombs in 1940s, they couldn't believe what they found. While most ancient fabrics decay within decades, here were carpets with colors as vibrant as the day they were woven, intricate felt hangings depicting mythological scenes clothing preserved down to the last stitch. For those of you who remember seeing the treasures of Tutankhamun Tour America in the 1970s, imagine discovering not just gold and jewels, but the actual flesh and blood of the ancient world. The Altai ice preserved not just possessions, but people. The famous ice maiden, a tattooed woman in her 20s, was found with her skin, hair, and tattoos intact. Her elaborate headdress nearly two feet tall, her final meal still in her stomach her DNA still viable after 24 centuries. These weren't just any Scythians. Their tattoos, clothing, and burial goods marked them as elite members of society, perhaps shamans, perhaps royalty. And what's extraordinary is how their physical reality contradicts the barbarian stereotype. Look at these tattoos, not crude markings, but sophisticated artworks depicting fantastic creatures and complex mythological scenes. 
Their bodies tell stories of cultural sophistication far beyond what their contemporaries in Greece or Persia understood. Perhaps most fascinating were the ritual implements found alongside them. Gold vessels containing cannabis seeds. Elaborate smoking tents designed to capture the smoke. These weren't just recreational tools, they were gateways to the spiritual world. While the Greeks and Romans ridiculed barbarian religious practices, these finds reveal sophisticated rituals that connected the physical and spiritual realms. The frozen tombs preserved not just bodies, but an entire worldview, one that saw no division between the natural and supernatural. Even more surprisingly, these tombs contained evidence of sophisticated medical knowledge. Skulls showing signs of successful trepanation, brain surgery with years of healing afterward, herbal compounds that modern pharmacology has confirmed have genuine medicinal properties. Some of you watching may remember when modern medicine dismissed folk remedies as superstition, only to later discover their scientific basis. The Scythians remind us that knowledge doesn't always progress in a straight line. Sometimes ancient wisdom anticipates modern discoveries. There's a tragic irony to these discoveries. The same climate change that's revealing new frozen tombs as permafrost melts is also destroying them before they can be studied. This genetic and cultural treasure trove is disappearing, even as we begin to understand its importance. But perhaps the most powerful aspect of these frozen time capsules is how they collapse time. Looking into the face of a Scythian who lived 2,400 years ago, seeing the same human expressions, the same care for beauty, the same spiritual yearning, we recognize ourselves. For those of you who have experienced the profound connection of looking at old family photographs from generations past, imagine that sensation multiplied across millennia. These aren't abstract ancestors, they're real people we can see and know. And what these frozen faces reveal about the true nature of Scythian society fundamentally challenges our understanding of power in the ancient world. We've been raised to think of ancient empires as walled gardens fiercely protecting their culture, their bloodlines, their identity from outside influence. The Spartans, the Romans, the Persians all prided themselves on who they kept out. The Scythians turned this model on its head. Recent genetic studies have revealed something astonishing. During the Iron Age, gene flow across Eurasia was more intense than it is today. The steppe wasn't a barrier between peoples, it was a superhighway. And the Scythians weren't just using this highway, they were its masters. You might remember from your history books how the Silk Road connected East and West. But long before Marco Polo, the Scythians were facilitating a genetic exchange that shaped the future of Eurasia. In the harsh steppe environment, genetic diversity wasn't a weakness, it was a survival strategy. Constant mixing with neighbors made them resilient and adaptable in ways that purer populations couldn't match. Think about it this way. While the Spartans were practicing strict eugenics to maintain their warrior bloodlines, the Scythians were incorporating the best traits from dozens of populations. They weren't weakening their society through diversity, they were strengthening it. This directly contradicted the purity ideals of settled empires, and perhaps that's why those empires were so eager to label them as dangerous barbarians. The power of the Scythian approach is perhaps best illustrated by a fascinating puzzle that has long confounded historians. The mystery of the Indo-Scythians. In the centuries before Christ, groups appeared in northern India claiming Scythian heritage. They established powerful kingdoms that lasted for generations. But here's the twist. Genetic analysis shows these Indo-Scythians lack the key East Asian DNA signature that defines true Scythians from the Altai. This leads to a remarkable possibility. The Scythian name had become such a powerful brand of fear and prestige that other nomadic groups adopted it, much like how diverse peoples would later claim to be Romans or Vikings. The Scythian identity had transcended genetics to become something people aspired to join, not something they were born into. For those of you who lived through the Cold War, imagine if the Soviet Union had welcomed Americans who wanted to become Soviet citizens, or vice versa. That's how radical the Scythian approach was in the ancient world. Look closely at their art, and you'll see it. Persian motifs, Chinese influences, Greek stylistic elements, all incorporated into something uniquely Scythian. They weren't just conquering other cultures, they were absorbing the best parts of them. 
This openness to outside influence didn't weaken their identity, it strengthened it. While purely civilized empires rose and fell, the Scythian model dominated the steppe for nearly a thousand years. But if they were so successful, why aren't they still here today? What happened to these remarkable people whose genetic strategy seems so modern, so ahead of their time? The answer to that question reveals perhaps the most profound truth of all, and challenges how we think about the very concept of civilization's rise and fall. Because the Scythians didn't truly disappear, their legacy lives on, hidden in plain sight, including, perhaps, in your own DNA. History tells us that empires fall. The mighty Scythians, who once dominated the steppes from China to the Danube, eventually faded from power. By the 3rd century CE, their name disappears from historical records. A conventional history might end here. Another great civilization lost to time. But the genetic record tells a different story. The Scythians weren't wiped out. They were absorbed. Their empire dissolved, but their DNA flowed into the gene pools of the peoples who replaced them. Sarmatians, Huns, Slavs, Turks, and ultimately, into many modern Europeans and Asians. This wasn't a defeat. It was a final victory of their open system philosophy. Today, their genetic legacy lives on across vast regions. People in the Caucasus, Central Asia, Eastern Europe, and even parts of Western Europe carry Scythian markers in their DNA. The Ossetians of the Caucasus speak a language descended from Scythian and carry genetic signatures linking them directly to these ancient steppe masters. For those of you who remember the ethnic conflicts of the 20th century, the obsession with pure national identities that led to so much suffering, the Scythian story offers a powerful counterpoint. They remind us that strength comes not from isolation, but from connection. Look in the mirror. You might see echoes of these ancient barbarians in your own features. The shape of your eyes, the structure of your cheekbones, small genetic echoes from people who lived 2,500 years ago. We're taught to think of ourselves as belonging to distinct, separate groups with clear boundaries between us and them. The Scythian story demolishes this notion. They understood what we're only now rediscovering through genetic science, that human identity is fluid, interconnected, and constantly evolving. So why has this story been forbidden? Why have the Scythians been relegated to a footnote in history, dismissed as mere barbarians at the gates of civilization? Perhaps because their success challenges our most cherished myths about civilization itself. They suggest that walls don't protect, they isolate. That purity doesn't strengthen, it weakens. That the most successful societies aren't those that keep others out, but those that thoughtfully bring others in. Many of you watching have lived through remarkable changes in our understanding of identity and belonging. You've seen walls fall and borders open. You've witnessed the human family reconnecting after centuries of artificial division. In embracing this interconnected future, we aren't abandoning tradition. We're returning to a wisdom the Scythians understood millennia ago. The Scythians weren't just barbarian kings. They were the architects of a connected world. Their story proves that identity is fluid, that strength comes from fusion, and that the greatest legacies are not written in stone but in the living DNA that connects us all. And perhaps that's why you feel drawn to their story. Because somewhere in your DNA, a small part of you remembers. You are their legacy. We all are. The forbidden truth was never really hidden. It was always there, in our bones, in our blood, in the connections that make us human. You are not alone in this discovery. The journey to understand our shared past has only just begun. Thanks for watching.